Our next guest recently spent months in Russia, Belarus, Serbia, Ukraine, and Georgia, surveying dozens of everyday Europeans to understand their attitudes on war. Russians reportedly did not take the prospect of war seriously, and post-war, most Russians seemed fine with it. Maxim Lott joins us now to discuss the rest of his findings and the geopolitical motivations behind Putin's invasion. He's a creator of electionbettingodds.com and Maxim Truth Substack. Maxim is also the executive producer of Stossel TV. Welcome, Maxim, to the show. So Hi, for having me. Yeah, so your uh, surveying found that many Russians are fine with the war. We've heard kind of some mixed things. So tell us what you've experienced in your surveying. Yeah, I think, you know, from the Western perspective, it's hard to see what people are thinking there. And it was just interesting talking with ordinary people, how many of them said, yeah, we think Russia does have a legitimate case here. Uh, no one was, you know, war hungry, like, this is great. I'm excited. We're taking back territory. But people were like, yeah, I feel like Russians are being oppressed in Ukraine and we should do something. And we are. And I don't know how the war is going to work out, but uh, we need to do something. That was kind of the, the average view that I got from people there. Yeah, Maxim, what do they think of the invasion part? Like, how, how do they think through? Because I can understand easily, you know, all, you know, believing all sorts of different propaganda that comes out of, uh, you know, what, you know, comes, you know, and, and I'm also curious what their what their media diet is like, what what you saw them consuming over there. But it, it does get hard to say, OK, well, I support the invasion. Now, uh, American voters didn't have a hard time getting to that place when it came to Iraq in 2003. So maybe it's maybe it's just that simple. But I'm curious what you saw over there. Right. Yeah. And first, it's worth noting that plenty of Russians do oppose it. About 6,000 people have been arrested in Moscow for protesting. Um, but there are also lots of people who uh, they probably aren't happy about it, but they kind of defend it. And they say, I, I ask, you know, OK, maybe you feel there are Russian people being oppressed in the east of Ukraine, but why do you need to take Kiev? And, you know, and they one guy I asked about that, for instance, he said, well, there are lots of right wing elements in Ukraine uh, who hate Russians and we need to get rid of that. And we need to take out, you know, their military ability, which they might use to attack Russians sometime. Uh, so those are kind of the Russian propaganda points. And plenty of people seem to buy it. Um, and in, in terms of the media diet, um, most people in Russia don't speak English. I mean, 90 percent plus. Um, it's only a few percent who might be good enough to like be reading the Western media for fun, so to speak. Um, there were some sites like BBC Russian, which people used, and also Instagram, where everything's just picture based. Those really help people get a sense of the Western perspective. Both of those available before the war are now blocked uh, and you can get around it by VPN, which lets you kind of trick your computer, your internet provider that you're in a, another country and evade censorship. Um, but a lot of VPNs are blocked now too. Not all of them. There's free VPN, which I was using there that worked. Um, but yeah, that's the information diet is restricted <laughs> and people are aware of that, but still it colors your view. Mm -hmm. and, and what tell us, what can you tell us about how much hardship the Russian people are actually facing as a result of sanctions and the other policies we put in place. Because we actually hear mixed things about that too, how, you know, how much this is actually affecting their lives. So, talk to us about that. Yeah, I mean, see, the word hardship, there's no one, you know, starving or on the street or like not making rent mm -hmm. right now. So people, life is still going about pretty normal. People are still gathering cafes for board games and all this, it's its normal life mostly. Um, however, you know, people are, people who do have investments are obviously very worried about that. People are worried like, is our uh, company gonna be operating in a month if we're losing all this business? So it's, it's more worries that I'm hearing than like, how am I going to pay, you know, my bill? Yeah. So okay. far. And so you, you know, you're known, you've done a, a, worked on a couple different projects, uh, but you've done uh, electionbetting.com, which I, I think, or you can correct me if I'm wrong, out of a belief that, you know, there's a lot of pundits just kind of proclaiming things and like, well, if you're confident in a prediction, you, or you can match your level of confidence to some kind of like actually putting money on the table. 
so I, you know, I take your um, your estimates or guesses or percentages for you know what outcomes might might be uh, more seriously than just an average pundit. And I, in your Substack post, you you had a, I, I thought were some predictions that pretty closely aligned with you know how I think we might come out of this. But you know, talk uh, a, a little bit. Walk our audience a little bit through, you know, how you expect this. I think you gave, you know, low odds to sort of complete, but but not in, by any stretch impossible, complete Russian victory. Zelensky defeated or maybe even killed. You know, lo, low odds of of that, but but maybe like a forty percent odds to them working out some kind of deal where you know Ukraine is still basically Ukraine, but maybe the odds of that are even going up now. Talk to us about how you're expecting this this to end. Absolutely. Yeah. First, uh, it might be worth mentioning what the betting odds are, because some of these things people are actually betting on them. They're saying there's a markets. Will Zelensky still be in office on April 22nd? Um, and that's risen to 80 percent. So people are saying it's unlikely there's going to be a total you know, defeat of the Ukrainians at, at this point. And that has risen dramatically as the de Ukrainians have successfully defended themselves. It went up from 50% to 80%. And um, they're also saying that Putin probably will not be overthrown. Putin also has an 80% chance of surviving the year in office. Um, and I think that's totally right. And that lines up with my observations that Russian people are not, it's not like true hardship yet. I don't see much revolutionary sentiment, so to speak. You never know what happens, but it's I wouldn't expect like a widespread uprising. Um, yeah. So those are the betting odds. And then I have some predictions as well. I right, know Maxim this morning, uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky addressed a joint session of Congress. And during his address, Zelensky invoked Pearl Harbor and September 11th as part of a plea for additional military aid calling on President Biden to, quote, be the leader of peace. He went on to say the Ukrainian people are defending not only Ukraine, but the values of Europe. President Biden is also expected to give an address on the assistance the United States is providing Ukraine. This comes ahead of a trip to Brussels next week for a NATO summit on Ukraine. So how are the odds of this ending, how are they you know, moving? You mentioned that right at the beginning, there was a lower chance that Zelensky uh, stays in power. That's now, it's now pretty high. He's expected based on a, uh, the, the betting odds to stay in power. Um, I, I'm, what, you know, what we're kind of hoping, what seems to be a, a likely enough outcome and a acceptable enough outcome, right, is, okay, Ukraine does not join NATO, but Ukraine remains Ukraine. Maybe there's some slight territorial cessation to Russia. And, and then I, I guess there's the kind of vaguer questions about denazification or whatever that is. Probably nothing ultimately comes of that. Uh, you know, how, how, how likely do you, do you rate an outcome like that? And are, are we getting closer, do you think, toward, toward that being what we get? Or, but it, it's, of course, possible that could still be weeks or months away, I guess. Yeah. I think it's very likely. Um, in my post, I gave it 40% that something like you just said would happen. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's up to, say, 60%, yeah. um, because I see both the Ukrainians and Russians are saying we're making progress on a deal. The main progress has been that both sides say uh, we're willing to basically have neutrality as a policy for the country rather than NATO. The sticking points are the territories, where you have something like Crimea, which is has long been Ukrainian, but the Russians have controlled it for years and they've even incorporated it as essentially a Russian state. So to that, there's Russian citizens there paying Russian taxes, voting in Russian elections. So they can't give that up. Um, and the Ukrainians also feel like they can't give it up. So that's a, a tricky point for them. And maybe they'll figure out something like, well, we'll just not even mention this in the deal and leave it at the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be a solution, which hopefully they'll reach. I think it would be nice, you know, Zelensky, they obviously want maximum support from the U.S. and they want a no-fly zone and all these uh, dangerous things and that they ask for. But uh, the U.S. can help push things towards peace as well. And that could be useful. Uh, and what do you, just quickly before we let you go, what do you think about the sort of Russian uh, military uh, performance? Because we hear, what well, we hear a lot in Western media, obviously, that, oh, this has gone disastrously for them. You know, it's so off track there. And, and that 
seems to be at least true to some extent. Then we hear, well, maybe the whole the whole invasion's about to collapse because they're not being supplied. It's gone really badly. And then it's like, well, is that just wishful thinking? It's so hard to know exactly whether the the how closely the Western, you know, very pro Ukraine evaluations of how Russia's performed um, are, are accurate. What's your sense for for how accurate a, a, a portrait that's been? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there's no doubt that it's been slightly overstated. You know, it's easy to look at anecdotes of a soldier, you know, giving a confession video about how terrible it is. But looking at just the map, the Russian forces are stalled almost everywhere except the south and east where they are continuing to make slow gains, um, which I think lines up with, you know, uh, like, Russian populations in these areas and, and how hard they're fighting. Um, but I think it's a mixed picture. It certainly was a huge debacle for the Russians. They weren't expecting this much resistance. And yeah, I think it's obviously been a mess from their perspective, uh, but they still are making some gains and probably still have an edge in total power. But mm. anyone's yeah. guess, I think it, it could, you know, there's a small percent, 10% that this just totally goes the Russian direction quickly and 10% they just collapse. Um, so war is unpredictable. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Maxim. That was very, very informative. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. More Rising right after this. <laughs>